This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. All Hit Radio. Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back to the X Zone, everyone. I am Rob McConnell, and yes, we're still coming to you after 24 years from our broadcast center here in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll free 800 610 7035. My email address is xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, xzone radio TV. And our main radio site where you can listen to the xzone 724 365, www.xzoneradiotv.com. My guest this hour is a good friend of the Exxon Nation. Ralph Ellis is with us. Ralph has been researching biblical history for more than 30 years to a degree and depth that very few other researchers managed to reach. His research is purely historical, and all places and characters and events with the, within the Bible narrative back into historical record. This has required some adjustment of biblical chronologically, chronology, but this is never done without justification. The result for those endeavors is 10 books that explain almost every facet of biblical history in purely historical terms. Now, remarkably, it would appear that the majority of the biblical record is a fairly reliable account of real historical events, the fundamental events that have shaped and formed the Western civilization. So the Bible is history, but Ralph will leave it to others to explore and explain spiritual aspects of this great historical narrative. Ralph's website is www.edfu-books.com. And joining us now is Ralph Harris. Ellis. I'm Ralph Harris. I was watching something from Australia today. Ralph Al- Ellis. And Ralph, how are you today? Very well. Good, uh, uh, good evening to you. Uh, yeah, good good to be on the show again. So where exactly are you this time? The last time you and I chatted, you were on the beach in the Philippines. Yeah, that's right. No, I'm in Spain now, so I do get around. <laughs> Congratulations on your new book, my friend. Thank you. It's just gone out actually just uh, one hour ago. It's just been released on uh, Kindle. Fascinating. And can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's a um, a reanalysis of Arthurian history because Mm -hmm. I wasn't uh, very satisfied with our current understanding of Arthurian history. And it was very interesting, very difficult, but very interesting. Um, because, hello, are we still with you? Oh, you're still here. We're just listening to you, my friend. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I had a few um, uh, gaps on, on, on my feed here. Um, so, yes, Arthurian history uh, is not all that it seems because King Arthur goes missing from the historical record. Um, there is no trace of a King Arthur for 600 years. Wow. He just does not exist. And that has to be explained somehow. Do we, ha- do we have any idea what happened to King Arthur? Well, yes. I, uh, the end result is he, he does not exist as a king as we tend to think of him as a British monarch living in Britain in the Dark Ages in the 6th oh. century. Um, and we know he cannot live in the 6th century, which is when his life is supposed to be. Um, uh, supposed to be placed because one of the main things he does is he refuses to pay Roman taxes and he then invades Rome. That's a key part of Arthurian history. 
And that could not have happened in the 6th century because uh, Rome did not exist in the 6th century. It had already collapsed. It had already gone. So um, we know the story is false as it's given to us at present. So so there were there was no round table the knights sir lancelot oh, well, lady there guinevere was. there was but there's been a cover up as Ooh. usual in in all of these stories that I've been looking at and it's a big cover up. Um what has happened is this story only uh, arose mm-hmm. in France in the 12th century. Uh, in fact, even more complicated than that, it, it arose in, in France and Italy and Germany in the 12th century. So you have to wonder why why this late era, 600 years after he is supposed to have lived, and these strange places, you know, the one place that we don't find a history of, of uh, King Arthur is Britain. Um so what happened? Well, the answer is that this story came from the Knights Templar. Ah. So the Knights Templar, they, they all went off on the first crusade, of course, mm-hmm. uh, end of the 11th century, beginning of the 12th century. And the first returning Templars coming back from the crusades uh, would have been arriving in northern France in the early 12th century. And it so happens that the the, the key player in this, as far as I'm concerned, is is Count Baldwin of Boulogne. Uh, And he was um, the crusader who went, uh, he took his army east. Instead of, most of them, of course, went down through Turkey and then they turned right and they went down towards Judea. I mean, that's that's the whole idea. They were supposed to be going to Jerusalem. Uh, Count Baldwin decided to head into Mesopotamia, and he went to Edessa. And uh, if if, uh, listeners uh, remember my previous uh, talks, they will know that my previous book was all about Edessa, which I say was the key pivotal city um, of biblical history, was all centered around Mm -hmm. Antioch, Edessa. So um, this particular crusader... Um, this is Count uh, Baldwin, went to Edessa and he liberated Edessa from Muslim control um, and and took that area and that city and that became the county of Edessa. And, of course, any returning crusaders, Templars from that particular campaign right. would have gone back in the early 12th century to Boulogne, because that's where he came from. Boulogne, this is in northern France, of course. And this is exactly where the story of Arthur began. So just at this time in northern France, in the early 12th century, suddenly we have the first Arthurian history. So this this is the 600-year time gap. Um, so all of the early chroniclers, so you know, if we go back into uh, sort of Celtic British history, right. um, the first of the chroniclers, you know, like uh, Gildas was the first. Now, he was writing at the time of Arthur, and he doesn't mention Arthur whatsoever, which is a bit strange. You know, Arthur is supposed to be the he's supposed to be the most famous monarch of the Dark Ages. You know, right. Uh, and Gildas doesn't mention him at all. Um, and then we have Bede, and, and Bede is two centuries later, and Bede doesn't mention him at all either. And then we have Nennius uh, from the ninth century, and he doesn't mention King Arthur. He mentions a warrior called Arthur, but he doesn't mention any King Arthur. And then it comes all the way up to the 12th century which we've been talking about Mm -hmm. and suddenly um, Monmouth is a a guy called Geoffrey of Monmouth suddenly writes the full Arthurian story but not until the 12th century and the reason is because that story came back from Syria with the Knights Templar and arrived in northern France in the early 12th century and that's why Arthur only became a king 
uh, in the 12th century. You know, I, I read the the information you sent us, and I found it amazing that uh, Jesus and King Arthur had similarities. For example, Jesus had 12 disciples, King Arthur had 12 knights, and, and I also added one where uh, Jesus had Mary Magdalene and uh, King Arthur had Lady Guinevere. Yes, and they are the same. And this is another interesting part of this uh, reevaluation because because I've made this link, mm-hmm. right? I, the link is that King Arthur is based upon the life of Jesus. So mm-hmm. this story came back from Mesopotamia, mm-hmm. but it was heretical because this this new gospel of Jesus was uh, was a gospel about a warrior king instead of a pauper prince of peace and of course that's deeply heretical you couldn't tell that story right so what can you do with it um well you can sort of dress it up maybe as a sixth century british king and tell the story that way right which is exactly what they did so that's that's how they overcame the heretical problem and and were able to tell the story so yes just as you say you end up uh, with this comparison between mm-hmm. Mary and Guinevere and if you if you go into Arthurian history and look up Guinevere it will say that Guinevere her name in is Welsh and it means white and I think well it's, it's a bit of a strange name isn't it for a queen she was called white well it's <laughs> it so happens that Guinevere Gwena is the Welsh name for Friday oh. And Friday, as as anyone that uh, knows French or Italian or Latin will know, is is the day of Venus, Vendredi. That's right, day of Venus. And in in Welsh, uh, Venus is called Gwenna. So she was the queen of Venus. And of course, if you look into biblical history, Mary was also identified always with Venus because they were. Uh, incarnations of, of Venus, Aphrodite, Isis. They were the sort of fertility goddess. So um, Mary Magdalene and Mary the Virgin were also identified with with uh, Venus. That was the star that Jesus was born under. He was born under the eastern star. And the eastern star is Venus. So was the star of Bethlehem Venus? Yeah, yeah, it's the eastern star. The eastern star is Venus, the star in the east. Wow. Um, so, so both are identified with, with Venus. And then all these connections flow out of – once you've made this mm-hmm. initial connection between Arthur and, and the life of Jesus, all these connections start flowing out. So um, uh, King Arthur was born under a, a comet – so uh-huh. he was born under a star from the east, as it were, you know, exactly right. in this, exactly the same fashion. He was born under a comet. So there was this comet in the sky which um, looked like a dragon, and therefore his father was known as Pendragon. Um, but it's the, 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 the comet is actually described as being a comet with two rays, it says. But if you look at the constellation of Pisces the constellation of Pisces is a constellation with two rays if you look at it how it's drawn it has two rays of two fish so the 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 comet that Arthur was born under was not a comet at all it was a constellation of Pisces so we're going back to the what we were saying before in a, in, in our previous talks you know about the uh, uh, Jesus, King of Edessa, book, yes, yeah. where everything was based upon the processional zodiac, and uh, I'm, I'm sure your listeners know all about the processional zodiac, so I won't bore them too much. But the constellations change with the millennia as they pass along. So we, you know, we had uh, the constellation of Taurus was dominant until 1750 BC. And then the constellation of Aries became dominant, and that gave us the era of the rams, you know, so Mm -hmm. all of the kings were identified with with sheep. And then we got to the first century. Uh, This is about AD 10. You know, it's it's quite accurate. It's about AD 10. Uh, Aries changed into Pisces. 
And this is why Jesus was born as a lamb of God and under Aries and became a fisher of men, Pisces. But Arthur did exactly the same because he was born under this so-called comet with two rays. And the comet with two rays is the symbol of Pisces. I mean, if, if you go and have a look at any zodiac and look at Pisces, it's, it's a constellation with two rays. So King Arthur was born under Pisces. But we can date this, of course, because we know when the date of Pisces was. And the date of Pisces was AD 10. So this is a first century story. And that sort of changes everything. It, it seems that every time I talk to you, we're finding more and more that that contradicts the the myth, the legend, the established scriptures. And that's what oh, I absolutely. that's what I love yes. about you. You know, it's it's about time this information came out. I was watching a show the other day, Ralph. That um, that talked about Noah's flood, and the story in in the Bible actually comes from Babylonia. Yes, but it was probably more uh, pan national than that. It wasn't simply just the, there was a Babylonian one. It's it's, it's written in Gilgamesh. Right, uh, is is the great flood myth. But the great flood myth is also a part of this same story. Ah. Because Gilgamesh, and I, I've been writing about this as well in the same book, this is, if you're thinking about Arthurian history, this book is not Arthurian history as you know it, um, because it, it ranges out across all these different aspects that you wouldn't believe are part of Arthurian history. You know, uh, History of the Holy Grail, which is one of the books of the Vulgate cycle, has this great section on uh, Pompey the Great. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, what's, what's that got to do with Arthurian history? But it's all components of Arthurian history, and it's all to do with the procession of the Zodiac. And, and the Gilgamesh story was a story about this heroic king, Gilgamesh, right. uh, who was dressed with um, a big axe and his bow and his sword hanging from his belt, you know, we, 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 we're, we're getting clues as to who he really was here. Gilgamesh was Orion. He was the constellation of Orion with his big axe or his club and his bow, right, which right. is point to, pointing at Taurus and his belt, you know, the Orion's belt with his sword hanging from his belt. Mm -hmm. um, so Gilgamesh was Orion and the job of Orion as the ringmaster of, of the uh, of the cosmos uh, was to kill Taurus which is exactly what he does in Gilgamesh he kills the bull of heaven and of course the bull of heaven I mean we don't need to think too hard about what the bull of heaven is uh, that was Taurus and the reason he was killing Taurus was to facilitate this transition between Taurus and Aries so uh, this is a description of the end of Taurus and the beginning of Aries. And so we can date Gilgamesh to exactly 1750 BC. And, of course, associated with, with the Gilgamesh story is, is the Babylonian flood. But are we talking about a real flood here? I mean, there were mm. real floods back in history, sure. which, which, which could have been, you know, a real flood. But Whenever these texts start talking about seas, what they're often talking about is the heavenly seas above. So they're talking about the heavens. Oh. So if you have a great flood, we, we, we could be talking about something in the heavens above. And I think what they're talking about when they talk about these floods is they're talking about the change between the constellations. Because, uh, you know, the great solar bark of Ra didn't fly across the heavens it sailed across the heavens because the heavens were the heavenly seeds this is why um, you know Mary Mary the Virgin but also Mary Magdalene was called the sea star the Stella Maris because it was referring to her position in the heavens above in the, the heavenly seas above so yes these are all part and parcel of the same story and it's a very different story. So it's, 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 it's been quite an interesting adventure. 
because uh, effectively what we have here in Arthurian history Mm -hmm. is a new gospel. This is the gospel according to Arthur. Well, actually, I suppose you could call it the gospel according to uh, Walter Mapp, who was the guy who actually wrote most of this. Um, no, actually, you could take it back further than that. You could call it the gospel according to uh, Josephus Flavius. Um, because we have this very interesting thing that most of the manuscripts um, that make up Arthurian legend say that the original author was Joseph Flavius. Right. Now, that's a big problem. <laughs> well, for Arthurian history, it is anyway, because obviously Joseph Flavius was, was a first century character. He was the historian uh, who wrote the history of Judea. And he is credited as being one of the authors, one of the original authors of Arthurian history. And, and so you get this big question mark and, and you know, some of the mm-hmm. venerable Arthurian historians say it does seem that this Josephus, because you know the the author is always called Josephus, it does seem that this Josephus is very similar to Joseph Flavius, but obviously it cannot be him because he lived in the first century. So, so they're baffled. They don't know why we get these accreditations to Josephus Flavius. Um, but. The, the 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 answer is is obvious because this was a first century story. It seems that astrology plays a bigger part in history than we realize. It plays a huge part. Yeah. If everything was to do with with astrology uh, or astronomy, because you know in in those days you couldn't separate the two. Mm-hmm. You know, the one was the same as the other, and but it wasn't just astrology. Of course, it was processional astrology. Right. So not the astrology we have of, of the monthly cycle. This was the astrology of the millennial cycle. And, um, and for good reason, obviously, because you can track the millennia with this particular cycle. So you, you, you know your history. You, if you know a particular king is identified with Taurus, you know that he lived prior to the second millennium BC. What is the connection, Ralph, between... Um, Greek mythology, because it seems that there there are, as as I see it, a number of similarities, and I know that Greek mythology is much older than than um, Christianity. We've got King Zeus, you've got the son of Zeus, which is Hercules. Uh, in Christianity, you have God, the son of God is Jesus. Both have their sons via an earth woman. How many how many gods of the of the pantheon were there? Oh, in the in Greek mythology, yeah. there were, were probably hundreds. Um, but this this goes back beyond uh, Greek mythology because it, most of it comes from Egyptian theology. Uh, so I, I even bypass Babylon because I don't think Babylon was the original. I I still think mm-hmm. that uh, most of this came from from Egypt. Um, but we had <clears throat> several exiles from Egypt, and, and I wrote about this in one of my other books, um, Scota, the Egyptian Queen of the Scots, if you remember that. Yes, one. I do. And that was centered around an exile from Egypt. And this was a very complex exile. This was to do with the Amarna dynasty. This is um, Pharaoh Akhenaten. Mm-hmm. And wasn't Akhenaten so much, although he was exiled as well, but I think the primary character was was Pharaoh I, who was like the uncle of, of Akhenaten, who eventually became Pharaoh after Akhenaten himself. And I, it seems, was called Danus. This is what Manitho says anyway. And I was exiled to Greece. And of course, he was called Danus, and, and therefore the Greeks were, were therefore called the Danoi. So if you look at the, any early uh, history of the Greeks, they're called the Danoi after Danus. So we have this link between these people going out of Egypt and settling in new areas, settling in, uh, there were strong connections with the Minoans, settling in uh, Macedonia, in Greece, right. in, in uh 
Western uh, Anatolia. And therefore, you know, spreading Egyptian culture out through the Mediterranean. And then we had the other big exile, which was probably again I and uh, and Kesanamun, his wife, um, that eventually went west and they went to the Balearic Islands to uh, eastern Spain and then they went to Ireland and Scotland. So we had this this uh, culture from Egypt being spread all over the place. Um, but obviously, when it when it went to these places, you know, all of the mythologies and the pantheon, the theology of of Egypt was amended and 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 you know recast. And so all of the Greek gods, I think, were, were based on Egyptian gods, and that's where we get this pantheon from. So I I, I remember many of our talks that the Garden of Eden was was in Egypt. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. That's this, this is part and parcel of the same story. It was the the Garden of Eden was the Garden of Aten, the the god of Akhenaten himself. Mm-hmm. So each of their gods would have a garden, and his garden was called the Garden of the Aten, which is the Garden of Eden. Um, and and we know this because the the Garden of Eden, the river that ran through it. Um, went through Eden and then it was split into four branches and there is only one river in this this region that actually goes through the garden and is split into four and that is the river Nile and that's been confirmed again in in several of my um, several of my books and even in this one it's, 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 it's funny how it's also in, interconnected yeah. because um, Arthurian history starts talking about the the Ophites um, and the Nazarene quite a lot, and the Ophites were the, were the snake people, the people who revered the snake, and it it transpires, and that, again this all comes from Arthurian history. So Arthurian history is adding to our knowledge in in so many respects um, that the Ophite snake, the veneration of the snake, was not a snake. It was the River Nile. Ah. So, if you imagine the River Nile that snakes around, you know, the eastern Sahara Desert, and then it gets to Cairo, yes, and it flares out just like a cobra into this big head at the top. So, the Nile Delta is the head of the cobra, the Egyptian cobra, and that's where this veneration of the snake comes from. It, it is the River Nile itself. You know, with with uh, the the Pope in the United States. Uh this week and he's addressing Congress tomorrow I, it, it seems so hypocritical here, you, here you've got all these people who are devout Catholics who truly believe this man to be God's representative here on earth and yet the truth is so different yeah and I touch on that as well it's, it's amazing where this Arthurian history goes to <laughs> I tell you, because um, it, it it gives us the history of Christianity, how it was formed. Um, so uh, before we've talked about Christianity being created by Josephus Flavius, yes. um, and he created simple Judaism mm-hmm. um, because Rome wanted a a Rome friendly form of Judaism. Because Ju- Judaism itself was quite radical, revolutionary, and the Jews were not very good Romans. So what Rome wanted was good, Rome-friendly Jews. And so they created this new simple Judaism, which we call Christianity. But some of the aspects of this religion were peculiar, to say the least, and not the sort of thing that Josephus Flavius himself would have invented because we have all these blood rituals, you know, the Eucharist, yeah. drinking the blood of a human, a human god, no less, which, of course, a Jew would never do. I mean, it's totally forbidden in, in Judaism. You cannot drink blood. And even in the New Testament, the beginning of simple Judaism, the, the Judaism that was given to uh, Saul, Josephus, specifically says you cannot drink blood. That was this, this came from James, the brother of Jesus. This is exactly the, the rules that he set out. So 
why, why do we have this blood drinking rituals within Christianity? Well, Arthurian history says that Joseph of Arimathea, uh, again, we're back in the first century, of course. Most of Arthurian history is all about Joseph of Arimathea and his son called Josephus. So it's, it's all a first century story. Um, and, of course, this son called Josephus is Josephus Flavius himself. Um, anyway, um, Jose- Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, and this is very peculiar, was the enemy of Jesus. And he was the person who, um, who he was the traitor who gave Jesus His tomb. to the Romans. Well, I thought that Joseph was the person to whom the body of Christ was given to to place in his tomb. Yeah, very heretical, isn't it? Yeah. Can you imagine how heretical this is? You know, Judas was supposed to be the bad guy. He was the best supposed to be the guy who I, sold Jesus. I think he was the Lee Harvey Oswell of that story. Yeah, he was set up. Yeah. Because Arthurian history says that the bad guy was actually... Joseph of Arimathea, and it was him that, who shopped Jesus to, to the Romans and got him arrested. And I'm reading this, and I'm thinking, geez, that's pretty heretical. How did they get away with that without being strung up? By, by exactly. The Church? Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's quite amazing. It's, 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 it's an interesting story, I tell you. Um, but anyway, later on in this same story, um, Joseph of Arimathea was sent by Emperor Vespasian. So we're we're back in in the Jewish revolt here. I mean, we're not we're not talking about the eighteen thirties again. We have this big um, chronological chasm within this story because it suddenly jumps from the eighteen thirties up into the eighteen seventies, and Joseph of Arimathea is actually an AD seventies character, and he is a, a colleague of Emperor Vespasian. So he's a Roman. Mm-hmm. Well, he's actually a Jew, of course, but he was working for the Romans. And Vespasian sent uh, Joseph of Arimathea to Saras uh, in order to take the surrender of Saras after the Jewish revolt. And you're thinking, hold on a minute. You know, A, what's this all to do with the, the Jewish revolt? And where is Saras? Right. And it turns out, if you follow the travel log of where he went, Saras is Palmyra. Uh, you know that the city at present that ISIS is busy, busy destroying? Yes. That was the city that Joseph of Arimathea went to. And it turns out that the king of Saras was the son of Jesus. And this is marvelously covered up within within Arthurian history because obviously they couldn't say that the son of Jesus lived in, in well not only lived in Palmyra he was the king of Palmyra um, let me I ask mean, you this who is the mother of the son of Jesus um, it's not actually given in, in Arthurian history we have the name of his wife mm-hmm. and we have the name of his uh, half brother uh, or cousin um, but we don't have the name of his mother. But, uh, yeah, the son of Jesus is um, is the king of Palmyra. So all of Palmyra, all of these temples that they're destroying in Palmyra at present, they all belonged to Jesus and the son of Jesus. This is what they're blowing up at present. They're blowing up the entire history of Arthurian legend. Um, anyway, yeah. the, the mission that... Um, Joseph of Arimathea was on from Vespasian was to take the surrender of Palmyra because it was Palmyra and Edessa who had fomented the Jewish revolt as it clearly says in in Josephus Flavius's books so he was sent very reluctantly I have to say he didn't want to go because it was a very dangerous mission into enemy territory to take their surrender and we have this big story about uh, how he, he, he gains their surrender mm-hmm. because he, he not only wants their surrender, he wants them to change their religion. He wants them to stop being Nazarene Jews and become simple Judaics, Christians. 
And this is his mission. He has to go and change the religion of, of Palmyra. And of course, this is quite a dangerous mission and he doesn't want to do it. Um, but the religion he gives to these people is, is Christianity, including the Eucharist. And I'm thinking, well, this is not something that Josephus would, would ever want. You know, he's, he's a Jew. He, he, right. There's no way he's going to be drinking blood. Oh. But then it says in Arthurian history, um, in, this is in history of the Holy Grail, it says that Vespasian said, go there because you are my vassal. You must do what I say, which is quite correct. You know, he was being paid by Vespasian to do this. Um, go to Saras, open your mouth, and I will put words into your mouth. So this wasn't half of this religion that he created was not actually Josephus Flavius' idea at all, or, or Saul as he was otherwise known. Right, right. These were the ideas of actually of Emperor Vespasian. So a lot of it was made up by Vespasian him, him, himself rather than Josephus. And it was based on, on Mithras, on Roman Mithras. So the blood drinking rituals of Christianity came from Mithras. And so we get all these wonderful connections <laughs> within our theory in history. It's, it's quite an amazing gospel, I tell you. So let me let me let me try and wrap my head around this. And you do this you do this to me every time you're on the show. Like I've got to tell you what happens. During our conversations, I take notes. Uh-huh. And then after we have our post production meeting, after we do what we have to do, and on my way home in the car, I put my notes on the dashboard. And I try and figure out what the hell the problem is with a world where we keep lying to the people and one of the biggest religions on the pl- face of the planet is based on a bunch of bunk yeah it, well it was it was based on roman propaganda and this is roman propaganda that that took on a life of its own <laughs> so it became its own religion if it if this is all false it's not true there are so many discrepancies in the Bible. Right now, the Bible and all the stories looks, look like, looks like a piece of uh, Swiss cheese with all the holes, my friend. <laughs> it does indeed. It, 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 However, it, sorry. Yeah. Go, no, go no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead, my friend. Well, it's, it's, it's actually true. <laughs> so the, the history we're given, you know, via Judaism and, and, and Christianity is mm-hmm. all true. It's just that we don't know it's true because it's, it's, we're looking at it from such a strange angle that we can't actually see what it is. So, um, so, so all of the history given in the New Testament is true, except that it happened in the AD 70s during the Jewish revolt. It was a story about the Jewish revolt. Um, Jesus was not a pauper prince. He was a, a king of Edessa. Right. And he was a warrior, mm-hmm. and he led a war against Rome, just as it says in Arthurian. And this is where we bring Arthurian history back into it again. This is why Arthurian history is actually tying up all of the loose ends into one, one wonderful story. So Arthur Jesus has this revolt against Rome. He refuses to pay their taxes, and he goes to war with Rome. This is what Arthurian history says, and this is exactly what Jesus, the, the Jesus of Edessa, did uh, as the king of Edessa. He started a war with Rome, which we call the Jewish Revolt, mm-hmm. and that's why we have things in in the New Testament, um, uh, like like the, uh, the the parable of of the uh, vineyard owner, and the, the vineyard owner goes away, and he gives the vineyard to a tenant and the tenant refuses to pay any taxes Um, and Jesus um, you know asks his disciples you know is this right and they all say no it's not right the the tenant should pay their taxes and then he says you know then we should kill the tenant um, and, and get a new tenant that pays their taxes when they are due and you're thinking, hold on, this is a bit of a strange parable for Jesus to be telling. You know, 
isn't he supposed to be a champion of the people, not not a champion of um, uh, absentee landlords who are looking for their rent? <laughs> but but of course this this is the Roman story again. Jesus was the king of Edessa and also the king of Syria and became the the, the king of Judea, the de facto king of Judea in the first century. Um, but Rome was living on his lands. So he is the tenant. So um, He is the landowner. And Rome is the tenant, the vineyard uh, tenant who, who is supposed to pay his rent. And Rome was not paying Jesus, Jesus, king of Edessa. He was not being paid any rent. So this is why we have this parable in the New Testament. Um, Jesus was saying to his followers, look, these are my lands and my tenants, the Romans, are not paying us any rent. Therefore, surely we should kill the tenant and get new tenants who will pay their rent on time. Whatever happened, it, to, the, whatever happened to the Ten Commandments that his father was supposed <laughs> to have written where it says, thou shalt not kill? Oh, well, we forgot about that one a long time ago. <laughs> Jeez, Ralph, you're, you're doing it to me again. <laughs> uh, there are some wonderful um, uh, parables in, in, in the uh, New Testament, which they, they are either glossed over and missed or mm -hmm. they are reinterpreted in different fashions. And this is one of them, you know, the, the, uh, it's, it's, it's a really good one. But that's what it was complaining about. It was, it was uh, complaining about the, the situation, the political situation. Right. Uh, in Judea at the time with the Romans uh, living on what he considered to be his lands. And this is exactly what uh, Arthurian history is complaining about as well, because Arthur, uh, King Arthur also complains that he is, the Romans are demanding taxes. And he, he says in one of his marvelous speeches to his men, but our family used to be at one point uh, emperors of Rome and he cites various reasons why you know they used to yeah. rule Rome um, therefore surely the Romans should be paying us taxes and not the other way around so Arthurian history is giving exactly the same story as, as the parable of the vineyard owner so why is Jesus depicted as this son of a carpenter who is the son of God, born of a virgin, who is crucified and buried in the tomb of Joseph, who actually yes. turned him into the Romans, that um, Judas was the scapegoat. Wasn't Judas? <laughs> wasn't Judas the one responsible? Wasn't he the treasurer for the uh, for the uh, for the uh, yep. disciples? And, he was the treasure. Yeah, and and you know, wasn't wasn't there a bit of of conflict with with um, well, this is the biblical account, not not the Ralph Ellis account. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, it's it's pretty much as as happened. So, so all of what you've said actually happened. So Jesus Jesus Christ was actually crucified by the Romans. Yes. Um, this happened in AD seventy, and we have a, we have a complete history of this event. Uh, it's just that people won't recognize this event as as being the biblical crucifixion scene. What happened is is we had the Jewish revolt, mm -hmm. and, and the king who led the revolt was called Jesus, Jesus Manu. Right. And, of course, Jesus was called uh, Jesus Emmanuel. It's the same name, same person. And But he lost the revolt. Um, the Romans won, of course. They, mm -hmm. they had the superior forces. And the the king, the king of Edessa, lost that particular war. And after the siege of Jerusalem, the leaders of the revolt, which included obviously King Jesus, right. <coughs> excuse me, um, were taken out and crucified. And we have this history, courtesy of Joseph of Flavius, who tells us all about it. So the three leaders of the Jewish revolt were crucified in the Kidron Valley after the siege of Jerusalem. But Josephus himself um, comes back from Tekoa <clears throat> and he sees them there being crucified after the siege of Jerusalem. And he's aghast. You know, how, how, how can anyone be so politically stupid um, to 
you know, kill the leaders of the, of the Jewish revolt. So he goes to the governor, who is Titus, and he gets permission to take them down from the cross. So he takes them down, all three of them, takes them down from the cross. Two of them die, and one of them survives. Familiar story? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's the same story, especially as the king of Edessa would have been crucified on the cross wearing the Edessan crown. And, of course, the Edessan crown was a crown of thorns. That was the traditional um, crown of the um, Edessan royalty, was a crown of thorns. So it is the same story. So, as I said, as I said you know, all of this uh, biblical-type history, the New Testament and Old Testament history, is true as long as you interpret it in the right fashion. So let me ask you this, Ralph. Was Jesus Christ, the one in the Bible, actually the Son of God, the person who millions and millions and millions believe is the creator of everything that we are, everything we have, everything that was, and everything that will be? Not in that sense, no, but uh, he was an Egyptian. So this was an Egyptian family mm -hmm. who had come out of Egypt. They had gone to Parthia, to, to Babylon. Uh, they had become kings of Babylon. They were kicked out of Babylon. And they arrived into Syria in the first century. This is why we have the story of um, this family being on the move and you know being born in a right, stable, right. all that sort of business. So they were originally of Egyptian heritage. And of course, all of the kings of Egypt, the pharaohs of Egypt were all sons of God. That was the royal title. Gotcha. So, you know, if you were Tuth Moses, um, you were the son of Thoth. If you were Ra Moses, you were the son of Ra. So all of the pharaohs of Egypt were sons of God. So it was just a formal title. Um, I'm not sure whether everyone believed that they were the sons of God, but that was the formal title of the royalty. And so Jesus was the son of God in the same fashion. So he was just acting out the same traditions as, as all of the Egyptian royalty. You have to remember, of course, Jesus was educated in Egypt. That's where he went for his education. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Why? Because he was educated there, because he was a prince of Egypt, as well as being a prince of Odessa and, and then, you know, a prince of uh, Judea. Right. So you, you can see how powerful this guy was that he could take over the throne of Rome because he wasn't trying to become the king of Judea. I mean, that was just a minor backwater mm -hmm. out in the middle of the east somewhere. This guy was already notionally the king of uh, Egypt, the king of Parthia, essentially, because he was, the, he was a son of a Parthian king as well, the king of Syria and the king of Judea. So he, he already notionally controlled the whole of the Eastern Roman Empire. It was only one more step to take over the whole of the Roman Empire and become the Emperor of Rome. And that was the goal he was looking for. He wanted to become the Emperor of Rome. And the battle he had in Judea um, during the Jewish revolt was with Vespasian, Commander Vespasian. And it so happens, of course, that Commander Vespasian, the, who won this particular war, became the next emperor. So it was a battle between two emperors, Jesus and Vespasian. And it was Vespasian who went back to Rome as the victor and became the next emperor. Ralph, how could this information have been suppressed or <laughs> hidden for so long? For so long, yes. <laughs> Roman propaganda. It was very effective. <laughs> Jeez, I, I, I can certainly see that. And it's like... So religion as we know it really isn't the way we know it. I like your version no. because it's, it's honest. It makes more sense. And is this the reason why... President Obama did not want to go into Syria because he may have known that Syria has played such a um, an important part in religion, Christianity. I don't know how um, 
Oh, I'm getting feedback now on my ears. Um, I don't know how much history they actually know, actually. I think a lot of our politicians are pretty dumb, especially about historical facts. I wonder if Donald and, Trump knows um, this. And yeah. what they don't realize is, is that the war in, in Syria yeah. is, is, uh, is 1,200 years old. It's got nothing to do with modern politics. Um, when, when the, the Alawites, the Alawites of, um, um, uh, Bashar Assad, the president of, of Syria, yes. are Nazarene. They are not Muslims. This is this is the whole problem with, with this war in, in Syria at present. They are Nazarene. They are the Church of Jesus. But they've pretended to be Muslims for the last thousand years. To survive? Yeah, of course. You, you've only got three choices under Islam. You yeah. either convert, um, you pay the jizya tax and you become a, a, a slave or a serf to Islam, or you die. So those are the three choices you're given under Islam. And they chose to semi-convert. So they pretended to be Muslims. Sure. So a lot of people do this. You know, the, um, the Druze in Syria do the same. They pretend to be Muslims as well. You know, it's like playing Russian roulette with a 9 millimeter automatic lock. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so they lived in the in the gutters of Syrian society for over a thousand years because they weren't true. They they refused to go to mosque. They they will not go to mm-hmm. mosque, and and they celebrate Christmas and Easter. So you know you know where they're coming from. Sure. Um, so uh, they were the poorest of the poor and the most persecuted people in Syria. But the French put them into power a hundred years ago because the French wanted an ally when they took over the region, when they were in control of Syria. And the obvious ally was the Alawites, because they were half Christian anyway. So courtesy of the French, they got into power. And, of course, all of the other Sunni Muslims uh, in the region resented this, of course, because now mm-hmm. the underdog had become the, the uh, uh, controllers of Syria. And so they've been hated ever since. And so they cannot ever give up power in Syria because if they give up power, they won't just, you know, spend five years in the political wilderness. They'll all be executed and, and exiled from Syria. And if the Alawites go, then all the Christians will go as well because you've probably noticed that the Christians in Syria have backed Assad all yes. the way because they're in the same boat. If, if, if Assad goes, all the Christians are uh, exterminated and exiled as well. So they're all in the same boat together. And of course, so, the, the, the war between the Muslims and the Christians goes back years upon years. 1200 years. Like, yeah, this it's is the same new, war. Yeah. It's being exactly. fought all over again. And this is why Assad could not give up power in, in, in Syria and he had to hang on for grim death yeah. via any way he could. There was no way he could ever. If, if he had given up power, four million of his people would have all been exterminated and exiled. So he had to hang on. Sure. Ralph, and, I hate to do this to you, my friend, but we're out of time for tonight. Do me a favor. Come back on in the yeah. next couple of weeks if you could. Because I shall indeed. This yeah. is wonderful and listen, I can't thank you enough for all the great work you do. And every time I see a plane fly overhead, I always think of you, my friend, and I wish you nothing but the very best. Be safe, and we look forward to having you back on in the next couple of weeks. Nice to be with you again. Thank Take you. Take care, my good friend. Exo Nation, Bye-bye. Ralph Ellis has been our guest. www. I've got it here. edfu-books.com. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news as we continue here in the Exo from our broadcast center in. Good old Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away now.